Hello, and welcome to Nature Revisited. This morning, I am sitting next to a beautiful waterfall in the woods near my home. This is a special place that I have been revisiting ever since I was a kid. The woods are alive with the fresh sounds and smells and sights of spring. It is here that I thought I would open this episode of Nature Revisited. When my friend Connie asked if I would like to do an interview with Julia Plevin, the author of the book, The Healing Magic of Forest Bathing for Nature Revisited, I said, of course, I would love to. Welcome, Julia. Let's start by talking about the history of forest bathing. So forest bathing, the term comes from the Japanese word shinrin-yoku, which literally translates as bathing in the forest atmosphere. So there's actually no water. You know, people, it's more like a sound bath. Like it's, an, it's a metaphorical bath bathing. Um, and the term was coined in the 80s in Japan when researchers did a lot of uh, studies to scientifically prove the benefits of being in nature to lower your heart rate, your cortisol, your stress, boost your immunity. And now there's been so many more studies on the benefits of nature. And it's just like more and more coming out. And, you know, we're finally realizing that it's like the miracle cure of everything is to reconnect to nature. And so it's a practice of going into nature with the intention to heal. So not you know, with the intention to burn a ton of calories or to climb a mountain or to do anything extreme. It's really all about just slowing down, awakening your senses, coming into presence and remembering. Like I always say that our, we inherently know how to exist, how to be in nature. And it's just a practice of remembering because so many layers that like, get put on top of us. So we have to peel off to remember who, like our true nature. So your journey to this yeah. discipline has a personal one. Yes. Um, talk to us about how, uh, a little bit about that, about how you personally came to this. This It's a long, you know, it's, it's my whole journey. Um, I guess growing up, I got Lyme disease and we think it was like when I was eight years old or so, but it really got bad when I um, was late in high school. Done all sorts of Western, Eastern, like all sorts of alternative health doctors and honest this healing journey, trying to figure out what was going on. And, um, you know, then antibiotics created a lot of like stomach issues, which created a lot of like mental health. Cause there's a huge correlation between your gut and your mental health. So I had anxiety, stress, depression, and this was all just kind of like what I thought was my lot in life to, you know, deal with was a part of who I was. And then I was living in New York city, getting my MFA in design. And it was there where I realized the lack of nature and how much of an effect that was having on me. And so like, while I always loved being in nature, it wasn't until I had no nature that I was like, realized the benefits of nature. And so I started to do all of this, this research on the ways that being disconnected from nature affects our mental health and then our physical health. And, you know, it started as more of an academic pursuit, but as I did more research, I really started to see myself in all of this research and these studies and um, as a designer, you know, okay, you spend a lot of time in the problem, but then it's like, what's the solution? What is, how do we reconnect? And that's been, um, for the past like five years or so, a guiding question for me is what does it mean to reconnect to nature? And I came across the term forest bathing as part of my graduate work. When I moved back to San Francisco, I started the forest bathing club just on meetup.com to see if anyone else would be interested in this. And what's wild is people started to sign up for the club and then a friend was like, you have to host something. So I hosted a meetup. The first one I ever hosted, a reporter from Business Insider came to and wrote an article about it. And um, so this article is great, but I just did a year long thesis on this. So I have so much more to say. So I started writing a bit about it just on a blog and more press and eventually um, a book deal came in my email, in my inbox. A, publisher asked me if I would be interested in writing a book on forest bathing. 
And I kind of had a, this sense ever since I started this club that I was doing like something beyond myself, you know, and, and when you do that, things happen that you don't necessarily know how to make happen. So like, I have no idea how to get a book deal, you know, but it came in my inbox. Oh. And so it's just about, you know, to me, it's like just what happens when you listen to your intuition and your follow your heart and connect to nature. Was there a person that you that turned you on to this or was it just you read about it and then just decided to look into it further? One of the main researchers is this man, Glenn Albrecht, out of Australia, and he coined the term psychoteratica, which is um, nature-related mental health disorders. And they created a whole slew of, of words, of terms, to affect the way that nature affects our mental health. And one of the main ones he has is called solastalgia, which is a loss of solace for something that um, you never left, like as it changes. And then the way that he, you know, has cured all of these things is something called solophilia, which means reconnecting to yourself, to community, and the planet. And I love that idea. And so I first was using the term solophilia and trying to really make that word happen. And that, uh -huh. something about that word, like the actual, you know, people are like, what is this? It kind of sounds like a disease. Like it didn't really work. But then the term forest bathing has this allure where you say forest bathing and even if people don't know what that is, they're like, they, like what is that? I want that. And so I really, like there was no one teacher. There've been many teachers along the path. And I say my ultimate teacher is just the forest. It's like every time I actually go into nature and observe and listen, I learn something new. I spent time with a Shigendo Buddhist monk in Japan. One of my main teachers is the founder of something called Shamanic Reiki Worldwide. And I spent time in the Ho Rainforest in Washington with her and then in Guatemala also with her. I did a forest bathing training with the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy down in Costa Rica. So there's been many teachers. Throughout your book, there are particular chapters that hit home for me. Mm. Like on the first one I really like was Live Your Life. Mm -hmm. Kind of talk about that chapter and how that is the beginning of your book. Yeah, so there's certain expectations of society of like what I felt like I was supposed to do with my life. None of these things were really satisfying me or making me happy and I kind of, and actually I have a really sensitive body where it actually makes me sick. If I'm not following my truth, I get sick. And so, yeah, forest bathing was a way for me to kind of cut out all of the noise, all of the shoulds based on like what my peers were doing, what the kind of the voices in my head from like parents or teachers or society made me think that I was supposed to be doing and just really get quiet and, and listen and really be able to listen to myself and like, who am I? What am I here to do? And I think that is a huge thing in society today, there's so much noise. And so to actually be able to have that quiet time would be with yourself, you know, and I mean noise like, like information coming in of like what other people are doing all the time, like what other people are eating for breakfast or wearing or studying or, you know, and like, well, what actually is true to me? And so I think when you go into the forest, you can find out what's true for you. That's, you know, I led a forest bath with uh, DOC yesterday and that was something that I was really passionate about these, talking to these students. It was like, you know, you get to choose, like you get to decide, like just the practice of going into nature and following your heart. So that's one of the invitations. When you're walking, meandering, just let your heart guide you, you know, and then go over there and then see where it guides you next. And kind of that practice of just, of not being on one path, but following where you want to go. Next one that I really liked is get outside and find a place. Yeah. So that's this idea of um, a sit spot. And that's a really basic and important practice of nature connection in general, and especially forest bathing. It's just finding a spot, and this could be anywhere. It could be in your backyard. It could be on a trail. You know, the idea is that it's not about finding the perfect spot, but it's about finding a spot that is easily accessible and that when you go there, you know, you might even just spend five minutes there every day or you get to know this spot really intimately and you start to see more subtleties the more time you spend with it. So like I'm a runner and I used to just like run trails and you just run back fast. You know, you barely really see much, but when you actually slow down 
the space starts to like expand and open up to you actually. And there's all these studies around psychology, especially around for children. And if they have these spots as kids, like these magical forts or places where they establish a connection to nature when they're young, they will always feel connected to nature. And then the idea is that you go back to your spot every day over the course of the season, over the course of the year, and you really get to see like how it changes and evolves. Disconnect to reconnect. Talk a little bit about that. You know, before I started forest bathing, I worked in tech in San Francisco. I worked at a startup. And so I, you know, intimately aware of tech, that whole scene and technology and how it's pervaded every moment of our lives. And even being aware of it, you know, you can I so find myself sometimes just like endlessly scrolling. And it's like, what are like, where are we, what are we doing? And then we just get so trapped into these little 2D boxes that we forget that there's so much more out there. And like, why is that what we're paying attention to? You know, and it's really, it's, it gets kind of icky really fast. And I personally believe that there's nothing inherently wrong with technology and it's all about our relationship to it. And we can improve our relationship. And part of knowing how to do that is by disconnecting. And then when you come back to reconnect, you can do it in a more intentional, sustainable way. The brightest minds of our generation are working on making technology addictive. And that's, and it's shifting, like even in the Bay Area, you know, people are starting to wake up to this and there's all sorts of, there's something called the Center for Humane Technology. And there's a lot of people like setting limits and there's like meditation has become something, like all of these kind of like antidotes to this issue. but. As far as I can see, it's not going away. So it's just about learning how to set your own boundaries with it and then reconnecting to something much larger. And the other one I really liked was where you're talking about look up. It's kind of that, kind of that, you know, once you've disconnected with this stuff or things, look up. That's one of my favorite studies I came across was that just one minute of looking up at a tree will increase your sense of awe. So they did a study where it was, I think it was college students, and they had half of them looking at a building and half of them looking up at a tree. And the ones that looked up at a tree experienced awe. And there's so much research around the benefits of experiencing awe in terms of like creativity, collaboration, sense of place, like oneness. And a lot of people feel awe it's like, oh, when I look at the Grand Canyon or, you know, these really specific moments in your life, but actually you can feel awe regularly. Kind of connecting back to the other one, um, sit in a sacred spot. One of the parts I really like about your book is how it brings this whole thing of awe and sacredness mm. to young people, which I don't think they, it's, Part of, even part of their vocabulary mm. or even part of their lives that we've forgotten kind of that idea of things being sacred. Mm. So talk, talk about how important to sit in a sacred space is. Yeah, it's totally and remembering that the earth is sacred, right? And um, that's a practice too of remembering and of shifting your mindset. And it kind of goes with what I said about the sit spot. So, you know, just getting outside and then finding this, finding these spots. And this idea of the spots is that they become sacred over time. And they become sacred when you enter them with a sense of reverence and ceremony. And you know, whether that means like, you know, picking up the leaves or the sticks and just making it a special place. Sometimes it's like giving it a name, sharing it with others. I know one of my teachers, she brought me to the Ho Rainforest where she spent a lot of time and she showed me some of her sacred spots and why they were special to her. And just like knowing why they were special to her made them really special to me. You know, so when I, I felt the energy, I felt that connection because she had created it. Like when you share it with other people, that's really can be powerful. And then another one is um, in Japan, I was with a Shigendo Buddhist monk and he has the area on where he lives. He keeps a lot of like really close while tending care of it. And so you feel that when like a human has been taking good care of the land, you can feel what that feels like. And then another one that's close to my heart is spark your creativity. But the idea that nature is, can really inspire creativity. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Nature is 
creation, right? It's constantly creating and growing and evolving and expanding. And like, if you think about oftentimes what we're doing as artists, writers, creators, is we are like painting landscapes or like we are constantly inspired by our surroundings. I wrote this book while I was living on Mount Tamalpais in Marin, just north of San Francisco. And I would spend so much time outside. And when I finally like kind of got out of my own head and just I'd get what I call downloads of like, of wisdom coming through. And it, I really believe that it's the trees or the land that had that, that wisdom. And I was almost just like trying to catch it and record it. It's almost impossible not to be creatively inspired when you're out in nature. And there's so many ways that you can nurture that creativity, making up a song on the spot, writing a haiku, gathering found objects to make like little mandalas or arts, you know, and just letting the colors and the shapes and everything inspire you. Yeah. The other one I really liked was designate a prayer tree. Mm. So I guess the general arc of this book as I intended it was that you it's almost like a hero's journey where you leave the known world and you step across the threshold into the unknown. And there's ways to kind of go through this unknown, mysterious world of the forest. And that's all the invitations I share. And then eventually you come back, back to society with your elixir, with what you've learned from the forest and you integrate back in. One way to do that is to bring kind of this wisdom and the reverence and the lessons that you've learned from the forest back to society. So a prayer tree has roots in many different traditions, but it's the idea of, it could be in your backyard or like in a communal space in a neighborhood where you, with natural materials, you could just use like yarn or sometimes even um, just some paper and you write little prayers. And so it's a way for the whole community to feel that connection to nature um, and to, into trees. You know, since I started the Forest Bathing Club and wrote this book, the, the movement is only growing. The movement of forest bathing, but also the movement of reconnecting nature and waking up to, the, to this idea of we are nature. It's, it's definitely becoming more and more apparent um, to people, I think. And, uh, you know, I see articles every day, and it could just be like what I'm paying attention to, but about how to solve climate change, to plant trees. And, you know, like, I really feel that connecting to nature is the solution. And it's this idea of nature heals us, and then we heal nature. And it's a kind of like this re reciprocal relationship that we uh, humans have always been in. And over the past couple generations, we've, we've gone away from, but it's time to be coming back to that. And when I feel lost or confused or anxious or stressed, I just go back to my practices, you know? So it's not like I, like, I think one thing is these are practices that I believe in and use myself. And it's not like a one and done thing. It's a continual relationship. What would you say the biggest benefits you have gained from your reconnection with nature? It's a sense of connectedness that I can always tap into. It's an ability to get out of my own way. Anxiety, stress, whatever kind of keeps me like, was would keep me like small or scared and I can, okay, notice that and then move beyond it. I really believe in the power of nature to heal on a physical, mental and spiritual level. You know, a lot of these different healing practices, people will say yoga is not for me or like Reiki, no, too new, you know, like, no one I've talked to has ever said nature is not for me. And I think that's just this inherent biophilia, like because we are nature, we are born from nature, it, it is home. And so everyone can on some level connect to it and feel that connection. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation with Julia Plevin and that you are able to find a special place in the forest, in nature. If you enjoy our podcasts, please share them with your friends 
and join us for the next episode of Nature Revisited. Visit our website, nordenproductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, productions.com to learn more. And as always, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Until the next time, please remember, we are nature.